My name is uh, Adrian Moors. I um, lead the Scala team at Lightbend, or Typebend, or Typesafe, or Typeface, or whatever you want to do with the name. Um, we're not too fussy. Uh, I've been doing that for about five years. Before that, I uh, was in academia doing time there <laughs> with, uh, with Scala. Um, is the mic okay? Because I can't really hear whether it's coming out or not. No, it's not in the back. I'll try to get a little bit closer. Is that better? OK. You haven't missed anything. I just said hi. Um, all right. So um, you know, Scala is an open source language. And to us, that means being open to your input. So I'll start with, um, you know, I have five minutes, maybe at the end, for questions. But I'll be at our booth for the next hour after this talk. Uh, if you have you know, any thoughts to share on how we can do better, or if you have questions, or whatever, and you, you know, we don't have time for, for that um, at, right after the talk, I'll, I'm, I'm just going to run over to the booth. Uh, and I hope I'll see you there for you know, your thoughts on, on, on Scala in general. Um, and so a, a big part of, of what we do at, with our team at Lightbend is to make sure that you have a good time using, but also contributing uh, to Scala. And so thank you very much for using it in the first place and for contributing to it even better. Um, there's a long list of contributors, and, and uh, it's always um, a thrill to see new faces on the, on the pull request queue. Um, even though sometimes it's also a little overwhelming um, in terms of uh, you know you versus us <laughs> getting uh, to your to review your pull request in time, but we really we do our best and, and we're looking for ways to, to do better there too. Um, Seth is here on the Scala team. The rest of us are pretty distributed, um, and so. Since this is the end of the year and people start making lists and New Year's resolutions, and I, I don't make those privately, but I guess for, for the project, um, the, the main thing that I would want for next year is to double the people that are contributing on a regular basis to Scala um, that are not names that you would recognize, certainly BFL or, or Lightbend, and that you'll start recognizing from being contributors to Scala. Um, and, um, that's an intent of, of being even more available, spending more time making sure that you can be successful doing that, uh, documenting our process on how you become a committer, um, being clear on the kind of stuff that we don't have time to work on, but that we would love someone else to pick up, and things that we think you know, need a sip or need a lot more discussion or maybe will never land in Scala. Uh, we're never taking away subtyping. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's not going to happen. So right now, it's about two to one uh, in terms of commits. It's a very poor metric, but it's about two to one. And so the goal is to get that to, to one to one um, when we can. So like I said, um, we want to do better in terms of highlighting the kind of work that we think is a good way to get into contributing to Scala. We have that label, um, but don't go to it right now because there's not a, there's not a lot of stuff there. But we're going to work on, on making a better selection of, of, of issues or features or improvements that we think we could help you with um, to get started. So you know, a compiler is just a piece of software. right? It's written in Scala. You know Scala already. Um, it has its own vocabulary, and it has its own way of doing things. But once you get into it, it, it really is just another piece of software. And I think that's one of the, one of the beauties, actually, of programming language theory, is that it all, all kind of like it's all so meta. But that sounds crazy, but it actually is, is kind of also beautiful, because you use the same tools to write your programs that we use to write, write the compiler. right? And um, like I said, it just takes some time to get into it. And, and, and we want to be there for you to, to help you with that. Um, and, and both you know, commit to spending some time on your pull request and getting it in um, as a more kind of official process. I mean, we do that informally when you contact us. We say, sure, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's work on this together. But I want to be more clear that that's available to you and, and that we're, we're there for you for that. Um, and, and just you know, also improving, oh, um, I'm going the, other, the wrong way, improving the response times for, for reviewing pull requests. So one of the, the lower hanging fruit that we've some of the lower hanging fruit that we've been picking in terms of contributor friendliness or, or user friendliness is standardizing on GitHub for everything. All the release notes are there. We moved from Jira to GitHub. Um, we do have two uh, repositories. One is explicitly for bugs, and it is a one-on-one -on -one import from Jira, or is as close as we could get to preserve all the numbers and stuff like that. And then there's one that we use for planning, and that will also be used for kind of work planning with, with all of you. That, that's why that's a public repository. That's where we plan our work inside the team. Um, so you can see you know, what we're working on, what we think would be cool to work on, um, so that it doesn't drown in, in the bug reports. Not that we have very many bugs, but you know, um, still like, nice to keep them separate. OK, we have a lot of bugs, but we're, you know, we're a big project. Um, 
the Scala Center is, is of course also a central uh, party to um, being open to the community, to helping the community. They represent you on the on the community on the Scala Community Center, uh, on the Scala uh, Center Advisory Board. Sorry, um, it's somewhat. Um, <laughs> the acronym isn't great, but okay. Uh, we moved from Google Groups to Discourse. I think that was a, uh, a pretty successful move. Um, uh, we're on Gitter. Try to be available on Gitter. It's, it's hard to be on all those forums at the same time, but we always try to have someone, at least from the team, uh, around there. Um, Seth, who's sitting right there, uh, if you want your... Uh, hi, Seth. Um, <laughs> if you want your, to add your project to our community build, yeah, he's the one in the corner here. <laughs> I can't get him to raise his hand. Okay, so Seth is responsible for the community build. Um, he tripled the number of projects uh, since April uh, last year that we that we build to verify that we don't break anybody's code when we when we change something in the compiler. Um, I, I think that's one of the great things that we've actually we've done over the last couple of years, which has given us more confidence to for example, remove features from the language or tweak features. Before, we would never know, like, is Scala test going to compile or Shapeless is going to compile after we do this. Now we can know that you know, before we even merge the pull request if we wanted to. So that, that's a big enabler for, for changing the language more quickly. Um, our our, our long-term support cadence is about 18 months uh, between major releases. And when you total all the small releases that we do, we do about uh, one every six weeks. And, um, we try to keep that pace, or at least maybe even go faster. Um, to give you a sense of that, um, for the 210 series, which started December 2012, can't believe it's been five years. Um, you know, we did about five updates in two and a half years, so two a year. For 211, we did about 2.66666666 a year, and uh, and some more sixes. Okay, um, uh, and now we've done already four in one year uh, for 212. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to manage to hockey stick <laughs> in the kind of um, you know, updates that we can manage in, in, in a year, but we're, we're definitely trying to bring you more fine-grained um, updates to Scala um, in addition to sticking to a more or less 18-month cycle so that you don't have to like, really upgrade your code base all the time. Uh, here's um, how that, that shakes out um, in terms of colors and uh, lines. Um, I don't know what to make of that. You guys need to upgrade to 212 more. Who's on who's on 210? Okay. That that's that's a good number of hands for 210. Um, 211. Spark. That's yeah, Spark. Well, I, I hear they're getting close to 212, but I I'd love to hear more about, you know, uh, we've 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 talked to them about SAM types and the, when we were working on 212 uh, to 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 help with with the, the API design, but it's a tricky one. Um, 212. Oh, yeah. That, that looks pretty. You're ahead of the curve here. You're, I'm sure that's that's uh, um, you know also a selection bias of being at this conference. Um, who's on a 213 milestones? What? You don't have to be ashamed about that. It's okay. Okay, no. That's okay. That's okay. That, that's. Uh, I'm happy to see so many hands go up for 212. Um, um, who, who is not using Scala and, and, but would like to? I, I'm not, I don't know if you don't want to use Scala. <laughs> don't tell me. I'm going to be depressed for the rest of my talk. There's one or two people that are like, I'd like to use Scala maybe. But, so most people who want to use Scala, it sounds like they are using some version of Scala. That's great. Um, so you know, I asked that because we have an enterprise thing to plug for you. Seth right there. <laughs> Hi, Seth. Um, he did the Fortify plugin. I don't know if, if you work in industry, you may have heard of it. Um, it's it's a common thing on, on checklists that you know you need to uh, you need to satisfy to, to uh, ship stuff. And so the Scala compiler actually has a plugin that emits the Fortify intermediate representation, so that you get pretty accurate uh, analyses out of the analyzer that that uh, Microfocus these days uh, ships. So it's a it's a security product that does some static analysis on your code. It's kind of an industry standard thing. Um, and so Scala supports that now. It's um, um, talk to our salespeople. I'm sure they'll be happy to hear from you. Um, so since this talk is about, is about 213, I'm going to talk about 212 a little bit because um, we're still so happy about it, you know. And there's still people not using it. Um, it was all about it was a compiler release, so we changed a lot of what the compiler does behind the scenes, but also very visibly, we're compiling to, to Java 8. That was a big step for us. I remember thinking about that a couple of years ago and being like agonizing, are people going to be willing to upgrade to Java 8? It looks like that was not really something we needed to worry about. Now Oracle has kind of like given us a whole new thing to think about, but um, 
I think the Java 8 upgrade actually worked out really well, and, and I think 2.12 worked out really well. So the two main things was that now finally we can compile traits straight to interfaces instead of to an interface and a class, and a function meshes really well with the single abstract method retrofit that, that they did for Java and, and functional programming, or at least programming with functions. And invoke dynamic, of course, our good friend Indy, uh, the bytecode macro. So concretely, what does this mean for um, even just the, the Scala compiler? A significant reduction in bytecode. And I've heard really, really insane numbers of people who use a lot of lambdas of like shedding. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much bytecode that, that difference makes uh, if your code is really heavy in, in lambdas. Um, so that was a big win. Um, of course, we're always talking to the Dottie team. Um, there, the, especially the trait on Lambda encoding, there was a lot of uh, fruitful collaboration between them coming up with some ideas, us testing it in the community build and saying that's not gonna work out, looking at how the JIT deals with default methods and stuff like that. So there's a lot of you know, experimenting going on in Dottie and then you know, validation on, on our end and, and engineering to make this production ready. Um, and there's a bunch of other things um, that, that, that have made their way from, from ideas in Dottie to implementation in, in, in 2.12. I'm not gonna go into the details. Uh, it's something I have to save something for, for questions at the booth, right? Otherwise, no one's gonna show up there. Um, we, we consider SBT an integral part of, of, of Scala, and so when we work on, for example, compiler performance, that also means build performance. Um, so on our, we've, we spend a significant amount of time trying to use the Scala compiler well from SBT and, and also be friendly to SBT from the compiler. So that made some big improvements in, in compilation speeds. Also, so long activator, hello SBT new. So SBT one is out. Um, it's not you know my credit to take, but yay anyway party. Uh, and you know they're on Scala two twelve or we're on Scala two twelve with SBT. So that's very exciting. Um, now, you know, I, I'm right after a really great functional programming talk, so I'm not gonna talk about this much, and I'll just, you know, go through my slides so you can't see them. Um, <laughs> but, it, I, so functional programming has, to me, just means programming with functions. Uh, what Rob was talking about, and I really, really liked to talk, was what I would call like pure functional programming or like mathematical functional, mathematical, uh, functional programming, but I think pure is a good way for it. I mean, you know, that, that makes us impure, right? Like there's reasonable Scala, I am the unreasonable Scala guy. Um, so um, to me, like all these things are, are tools for you to be productive with and you know, to, to, to communicate the intent of your code to your, to your, to your future self or to your current uh, colleague. And functional programming has a lot to offer uh, in terms of simplicity, I think, and the way that you can really express algorithms that, co that have great cohesion and that let you reason about them. So that's, for example, where purity comes in, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's not functional programming because math is great, even though it is. It's, you know, we have this problem to solve. Our code is complicated. How do we simplify it? How do we express more directly? Or how do we write code that like a Spark backend can optimize? Um, and, and so one kind of silly example, but I, I think it does drive the point home, or at least I hope it will, and uh, maybe you can tell me later if it didn't and I can I tweak the slide, but um, expression is like an algorithm that is really like much closer to what you would write you know, on, in a math paper or how, the way you would think about this in your head. Like I wanna do this or that and then you know, pass that on to a method. Like if you don't have expression first thinking, you need to pull that out in statements and say, hey computer, First compute this condition, then think of, store that result somewhere, and if that's the case, put that in that variable, otherwise put that in another variable, and then you create distance between how you compute the argument to that method and where that argument is actually um, um, uh, consumed. And so the bottom version of that rewrite, you could easily imagine more and more code kind of accumulating where that comment is, and you know, you're a factor, you're a factor, and after a while, you know, there's no more connection between the input to that, to that method or that function and, and what you originally wrote. And I think that's a really real thing that happens. You say, oh, Java has the ternary operator, but now you need to you know, use a different syntax for something that is really conceptually the same. Um, I kind of get some people like stare at me, and other people go like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I, I'm, the room is too big for interaction, but please let me know what you think about this. Um, I think the, the key thing here is that we know really well from lots of other programming paradigms how to compose data. Why not apply those same tools to your code? And when you, when you think in terms of statements, like when you think about 
step one, step two, step three, return something, throw some exception, mutate some, some thing in a distance somewhere that I hope will still be what I put in there when I get to what I'm actually going to do with it later. Um, you're not really expressing yourself that succinctly anymore. And you're also not really able to reuse code that actually talks about how things flow. Um, there have been way better presentations on this than, than I can do at this kind of abstract level, but um, a lot of this is about, a lot of the cool stuff that you're seeing these days is, is about thinking of code as data, like staging, um, the collections where um, iterators are just a reification of data processing steps that you want to do uh, the effect on your, on your, on your collection. Um, and then you know, the, the library can look at that and optimize it. ACA streams, for example, you express this whole processing pipeline or graph that you want to do with the data that's flowing through the system. And then the implementation actually looks at all your code and just manipulates it like it was data and optimizes the out of it. Um, so the way to think about it is you don't optimize framework, framework will optimize you. Okay, and I think that's, that's a great thing to enable with thinking of, and I think that's also kind of what Rob was talking about earlier, is that once you have these, these, these combinators, you can think of more efficient ways of doing these combinators, or you can start thinking about doing you know, fancier stuff than just saying this and then that and then that. You could say, well, if I'm doing all that, how about I just do this in one shot? You know, like fusion and deforestation, all that cool stuff that you can only do, of course, if, if you're managing your effects carefully. Um, and as, as explained very well before me, when you, when you have that kind of purity or when you, when you, when you know what, which effects are, are happening, you can just look at the types and, and put stuff together. And that's very powerful when you think about larger scale things like you know, manipulating really big data sets that are going to be very expensive to run an experiment on. And it turns out you thought that was a string, but actually it was a date or something like that. You want to know that before. And with that ad additional knowledge, you know, the, the framework can do a better job of optimizing your code, obviously. So I'm assuming I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. But you know, these abstractions also have their limits. They have a runtime cost. They have a, real, really, a, a very real runtime cost. They have the bug time cost. They have like a what the fuck per second kind of cost. Um, you know, abstractions should really be about, I don't want this thing to go wrong. It would be really bad if someone were to just tweak this. Abstraction is not, oh, I might want to change this later, but right now I only have one of this. Let's just factor it out anyway and obscure the intent of this thing because maybe the intent was there actually is only one thing that you want to do here. So use this with, with, with some compassion for your future self or, or your colleagues or, or some trepidation. You know, abstractions don't necessarily make your code better, um, but they definitely have very much potential to do so. Um, it's also about convenience. And then we talk about things like type inference, but don't take that too far. Public types are documentation. Um, you could say, well, we just generate the types. Well, no, that's a maintenance liability. You know, if they really are purely generated, and then you might as well not write them, right? Um, so that's kind of a, a dig at Java for those who, um, anyway. Um, case classes and pattern matching are convenience. If you deal with a lot of data, you want to take it apart, and you want to put it back together safely, um, that's, that's a great way to think about things. And here you see again that it's about values and expressions and not I have this thing that I need to build up mutably and hopefully at some point I'm done. It's really about thinking about these things as, as mathematical, ethereal objects that you can reason about later. And it's also just about sometimes you can just like feel okay and just throw your hands up in the air and sprinkle some plus and minuses and know that it'll be okay, right? And I mean, I have had this slide in this deck for a long time, and I keep it there because people laugh at me, and I think they think I'm funny. But it's, I mean, it, it's 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 a good thing, right? It's not like you should feel bad for not thinking about this. You also don't think about, oh, am I going to get no such method errors, or am I going to get, oh, this class doesn't exist that you tried to extend, or, you know, the the type system can do a lot of good for you if you let it. And I think variance is one of those examples that is a little bit more exotic, but it's it's the same thing, and. Um, we got your back with this. You know, we, that, that's part of our job is to make it easier for you to express your code, to refactor without fear, to actually evolve your code bases, to know what they're doing. Um, but also, we don't want to get in your way. So there is, just for, for us as well, there is a limit in how far we, we want to go with abstractions. Some things are just too complicated and have too much of a, of, a, of a cognitive burden for us to impose on you. And so, for example, effect tracking is one of those things. It'd be great to have, we just don't know how to do that um, and not you know, drive everybody away. So to get back to variance, 
Um, what I mean is you don't have to know anything about variance. You just have to have you know, this, this, this intuition for functions that, <laughs> thanks Vlad. <laughs> I'll keep this slide too for the next version. Um, so, you know, functions are just this, this, this intuition that you say, well, if I have a function that actually takes more arguments, that's totally fine. If it, if it imposes fewer restrictions on its input and actually provides a better output, then I can use that function instead. And that's covariance and contravariance. Um, contravariance for the arguments, covariance for the result. In Java, it pre gets pretty wild. You have wildcards everywhere, and the users of the function abstraction have to remember th which way variance goes. You know, contravariance for the arguments, covariance for the re result type. Imagine having this sprinkled all over your code when you're just, all you're doing is putting a function literal in a local variable. I mean, they're doing something about this, and they are very well, very well aware of it. This is just to show that certain things in a language that you think wouldn't be related to being nice for functional programming actually are. And having been designed from the start for this makes a big difference in your day-to-day -day usage of, of that language for functional programming. And you know, there's many more examples like that. So now that I got that off my chest, I think I'm just gonna drink some water, let you all go like, all right, um, this is actually what we're here for, Scala 2.13. Um, so we're about, I would say, halfway through through the time frame for 2.13. It's um, due first half of next year. Um, we're still talking in halves, not quarters. That's that's kind of, I do need to do some hedging. Um, oh, I hear myself a lot. Um, so 2.12, like I said, was a compiler release. Um, 2.13 will be a library release. So we're doing that because we don't want you to have to adapt to new language changes and new library changes at the same time on, on your upgrades. And so we're, we're kind of spacing those out. Um, there is a ticket um, on, on, on our Scala dev tracker that has the various themes that, that we think are important um, or were important when we were working on them. Excuse me. Um, and, and so I invite you to participate in, in the uh, liking or disliking of, of various ideas or adding new ones. So the headlines, as you are well aware, um, we're working on simplifying the collections. Um, Stefan is leading that work at, on our end. Um, and, and EPA Founders Scala Center are, are, are also involved in that, of course. Um, we're currently bootstrapping the compiler on the new lib on the new collections. So that that's that's I think it's down to like the double digit compiler errors last time we talked. Um, and um, that's I'm going to talk a lot more about that part. Um, modularizing the, the the core library that's what we started doing in 2.11, um, and, and you know now that we have another library release, we're continuing that work uh, with Java 9 um, around. Um, it, it makes a lot um, more sense also, I think, to, to do that more modularization. Um, and and user-friendliness is, is, is a big theme for us um, that we care a lot about. So I think, you know, there, there's, Stefan did a really good talk at Scala World and had, wrote actually a really nice blog about this too, so I'm gonna mostly refer to that. Um, and so I obviously upload the slides and you can click on those links. I know that's kind of hard to, to write down blog. <laughs> um, but you know, they're, there's, uh, they're there and, and the links are in the, in, the, in the slides that I'll distribute or tweet later. Um, so the old collections were pretty good, but they definitely suffered from a little bit of over-engineering. Um, and, and so we're looking to simplify that both on the usage and, and, and uh, implementation side. Now, you know, I know people are using the collections, or at least I assume you are. Um, so we don't want to we don't want to complicate your lives too much. Um, there there has to be some value in the upgrade, right? So we're definitely working on making sure that let's say 90%, 95% of, of standard use cases you won't notice the difference. If you are using Breakout or you are defining your own can build from instances, you might have to read up on the blogs and maybe pitch in in discussion if if you're afraid you're going to be affected. Uh, to there's still time to to tweak certain things to make your life easier. Um, so, can build from. Um, it, it, it's a beautiful thing. It also caused a lot of grief. Um, it was it was it was the intent was pure, but a lot of people felt that they were being lied to, uh, and so um, we've vastly simplified it, and it's now called build from. It's um, not on this slide anymore because this version of map doesn't need it, and in fact, most versions of map don't need it. Um, when you're just doing simple overloading, we fixed a bug um, that had originally kind of driven us towards the can build from solution where you can have an overloaded polymorphic higher order method and still get type inference for the argument types of the function literal. 
there is a link there that you can read all about that. Um, but the idea is that now map is just overloaded like you would overload anything and not overload it by using implicits. I think the signature looks a lot cleaner. Um, we still do things like can build from. So breakout, like I said, is gone. Um, but there is a, a much neater way to do it. Before, um, the, the two method had a type parameter. So you have to look pretty carefully. I think I got the font big enough that you can see the difference that these are pointy, sharp, danger, Will Robinson, and he, these are nice and round. Um, values are you know, much safer to deal with and much more versatile. So here you can pass in sets, bit sets, maps. We don't care. Uh, you, can, you can build to all of those. And in, in combination with views that actually work, you get a very nice alternative to what Breakout was originally for and with much less crazy magic. Um, so like I said, views actually work. Um, they're a lot like Java 8 streams, in fact. Um, we like that idea. And, and so you jump into the view world, you start reifying your operations. This is all the code that you're passing in as, date, as data. The, the, the view hangs on to that. And then when you ask for the actual result, it'll run your pipeline that you've constructed there. Um, lazy collections are also built on that. So there's a lot of lessons learned in there and a lot of really nice cleanups and, and very pragmatic cleanups that have gone into the redesign. And I'm excited, I'm really excited about it. And, and, and please take a look at Stefan's talk and his blog and, and let us know what you think. Um, we're, we're finalizing the design um, beginning of next year. Um, it, it's, it's mostly done now already. So you know, hurry up and, and give us some feedback if you think there might be something in there that you, that you don't like. Um, parallel collections are already out of the, of, the, of the standard library. They're now extension methods to get into the parallel hierarchy. One of the things that actually complicated the old design was that it tried to abstract over being sequential and parallel. And it turns out people actually care whether something is parallel or sequential. So don't over abstract. You know, that, that kind of goes back to what I was saying before. You don't really want to mix those things up. So there's no point in having a common supertype for that. Um, the, the, the modularization that we've been doing since 2.11 has, has culminated in a standard library that, that fits into the Compact 1 profile. So for you not familiar with Java 9, that's the difference between like a 20 meg image and a 200 meg image or something when you're, when you're deploying um, to Docker or whatever they call these hip things these days. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just in my, in my happy sheltered you know, ivory tower. Um, and you know, we, we definitely want to continue making way for some of the older stuff that was in the standard library that a grad student wrote me, for example, uh, thinking that would never be used, you know, like months from now, let alone a decade from now. So some of that stuff just has to go, and we're very thankful for for um, for everybody in the community who, who's working on on adding more modern implementations for those modules. Um, so I know faster compiler. I made it to like past, you know, I don't know, like at least half the talk. I didn't talk about a faster compiler. Who like thinks that is like the major hurdle for adoption for Scala? Let's say like to break through to like the next level. One, two, three, four, five, six. So okay, let's abandon this effort. Uh, I don't see too much. <laughs> be a lot easier to just run in your browser or something. That'd be that'd be cool too. Um, Okay, so we're going to work on that anyway. Um, and I mean, we have been, you know, for a long time now. Actually, uh, we've uh, we've locked up Jason for a couple months, and he comes back with like 20% improvements. Um, <laughs> we feel like we've kind of tested his limits in terms of how long he cannot see his family. So we're probably going to have to like rework our um, our strategy there. And so um, talking to 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 uh, RSC, you know, it's, the R stands for reasonable. Uh, and uh, Kentucky Mule, that stands for a cocktail. Um, uh, but we're definitely talking to those guys and looking at those ideas and, and, and pulling them back in to the compiler is, is one of the, the big projects that, that we're working on. Um, well, now in terms of, 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 the, of, of coming up with new ideas and, and, and fleshing them out and next year in terms of experimenting with them. We have automated benchmarking and charting um, that you can use to illustrate how much faster we are. So this, it's th this, this much faster, or like, you know, like that much faster. Um, th I mean, that's, that's pretty nice. We do about 120,000 lines of code in 35 seconds is what that says. So you know, if your code base is about of the same size and you spend a lot more time in the compiler, 
maybe try staying in Esbetishal or like, you know, figure out what's going on. We'd love to know. And that's definitely also something that we want to work on next year is to give you more tools to figure out how many lines a second your compiler is doing. Jagosh had, a, had a, opened a bug about that recently, and I think that's a great idea. And also would be a great thing to, to contribute like as an SBT plugin or something like that. Um, but so, you know, it, it does like 3,300 lines a second. It's not exactly terrible, but I agree it could be better. Okay, um, user friendliness for to me that means better tooling and better docs, um, and of course that means a lot of things, right? So wh what do I mean? Um, so these are examples actually of stuff that we would love some help with because we just can't seem to get to them. I did a big refactoring of the way that errors are reported, but we never got to designing the language for actually configuring it. You know, it's language design, it's kind of like search in Google Docs, like they're, they'll get to it eventually. Um, so maybe we'll eventually figure out how to design a language for to configure our error reporting. Um, suppress warnings. I think, yeah, you know, you need those things to, to actually be used in practice. I totally agree. It's just one of those things that just keeps falling off the wagon when you have other things to do like, like Java 8 support and a uh, small team. So this is something that we'd love to work with you on if, if, you, if you're excited about working on things like that. Um, you know, getting more features from the REPL, I mean, and by that I mean steal them from Ammonite and port them to, to our REPL. So that's actually what I'm working on. And I told, I told Howie that, you know, he should be afraid. Um, we're, um, I mean, glad, uh, uh, imitation, flattery, and so on. Um, so we've, like, that, this is what I've been doing in my copious coding time, um, is, is really look, go take a hard look at the REPL, kind of apologize to my colleagues from 10 years ago and say, like, sorry, this is a little bit over-designed here and there. Let's clean this up and, and, and drag it kicking and screaming into this millennium with, you know, stuff like syntax highlighting. Um, we also, I think a really fun project to help with. You, you really get like feedback of, oh, look, there's color on my on my console now as I type, you know. Or I can, I don't have to remember how many times I have to press up to like do multi-line history or something like that, you know. Like things, things like nice things like that would be great to have, and and that's something that that I'm I'm working on. Super glad to see Scala fix Olaf um, and, and the Scala Center. Uh, we definitely intend to use this um, already now for upgrade to 213 uh, for the collections and for, for, other, for other features that are going to change in, uh, in, um, in 214. It, it recently acquired the ability to do also do uh, checking and, or linting. Um, abide is no more. I, um, I'm a little sad about that, but that's okay. Um, so uh, in terms of what's coming after 2.13, so that's, that would be uh, you know, somewhere mid-2019. Faster, um, already talked about that. That's going to remain a theme for a while. Um, and, and not just a faster compiler, faster tooling in general. It's like you're, you don't care whether it's the compiler that's slow or whether it's SBT starting up or whether it's this or that. You know, it, we're, we're, we care about the experience from once you like, you know, install Scala for the first time and are compiling your project. Like, what are all the hurdles in the way? What is the slowness? What is causing it? And how can we get rid of it? Okay. Um, we're definitely interested in, and, and there's already support out there for the language server protocol. So um, VS Code, who would have known? Who would have predicted that we were going to be targeting Visual Studio with Scala, uh, or some derivative of it? Um, we did have a .NET backend for those of you um, who have been around long enough to remember that. Um, so anyway, we've we've been working on on, on well, Julian actually, uh, um, a former uh, type safer, uh, has been working on that in his spare time. And we're, we're definitely thinking of investing in, in, in helping the, out there. Um, clear error messages has been proven in Dottie and, and Rust and other languages to be really nice. And, and it's possible. I mean, if they can explain the Rust type system well, I'm sure we could do a better job explaining the Scala type system. Um, so that, that's something I'd, I'd like to work on. Don't get me wrong, Rust I'm sure is a great language. Um, simplify, simplify, simplify. So I'm sure this is all super easy to read. Um, you know, we want to get rid of a lot of stuff, and I don't really want to tell you, so I just kind of, kind of made it hard uh, for you to take pictures. I mean, I guess maybe a picture would be okay. So there's a lot of stuff in Scala that has crept in over the years that irks me um, and that I would like to get rid of. And once we get more um, confidence that we can do that with Scala fix and, and with a community build, um, we. Uh, I think we will try some of these things. So this is kind of spitballing a list of things that I would like to get rid of. So maybe I'll just walk you through it. Early initializers. Who is using early initializers? If, you, if you're using it and you want it, raise your hand now. There's one, sorry. <laughs> Two. 
two of you, I'll, I'll buy you both a coffee and we'll call it even. <laughs> okay, um, we'll do trade parameters instead. So are you okay with that? Um, yeah, you're okay with it? Yeah, you're okay with it too? Trade parameters? No? Okay, yeah. Okay, well, so trade parameters, hopefully instead. Uh, procedure syntax. <laughs> Who despises procedure syntax? All right, good. <laughs> you can all buy me a coffee then. I'm still, I'm still, <laughs> still come out ahead. Just not all in the same day, okay? <laughs> it's not going to worry. It's not going to end well. Um, ex crazy existential types. Who wants to admit using crazy existential types? Crazy existential. Okay. Yes. Well, John, I knew that about you. But uh, existential crisis ahead for all of you. Um, I think you know, as as kind of um, already in, in Dottie, you know, we want to do kind of the equivalent of, of Java bounded wildcards like existentials, not ones where you can do f bounded polymorphism and stuff like that. Which, by the way, doesn't work. Okay, like existential subtyping depends on type inference for these things, and type inference for f-bounded stuff doesn't work. It doesn't work for type constructors very well either. So um, it's just kind of being honest with you about the parts that actually kind of have been fudged for years now. Um, white box macros. No one cares about those, right? Next one, fast <laughs> implicit scope. So, I mean, my, my stance on macros is there's a lot of good you can do with it, and there's a lot of really terrible things you can do with it, and really slow down compiles, really obscure intent. We don't want to take away all the power of macros, um, but some of the craziness is going to have to go. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, you can, you can, you can just, I don't know. I don't know what you can do, but not this. Um, and so some of, the, some of the features that we like, like deriving something to generate type class instances, I think we should just own up to it and say, this needs to be in the language. We can't make everything so extensible that you can do this. Okay. <laughs> All right, I hear, is that like cocktails or beer or what, what are you buying me now? Um, okay, so that, that's kind of the thinking there. The vast implicit scope that we have, just imagine like David Attenborough saying, the vast implicit scope where the implicits roam in their natural habitat, it's going to get a lot more narrow. Okay, I don't know how to do it yet, but I, I want to get rid of the craziness of where all the implicits can come from. Okay, implicits are never going to go away. And that's one of the things that makes Scala Scala, and I agree with Martin on that. Um, but I hanker for the simple days before we looked at all the parts of all the types and all the companion objects and all the superclasses of those and all the package objects and you know all that craziness. I would love to get rid of that, okay? Um, I'm not going to ask who likes that or not, but you can come yell at me later. Um, even less controversial, implicit conversions. Okay, we have implicit classes. Um, that should be good enough. Package objects, who needs them? <laughs> Seriously, who needs them? What for? Sometimes you want to have some functions, but you don't yeah. want it to be in an object. Top level things. Okay. Maybe we can do top level things instead. How would you feel about that? Okay. Let's do top level things instead. You know, like that's, I mean, and this is all just for, you know, we, we're not a public company, so I don't have to say this, but I will anyway. This is, you know, a declaration of intent, not a promise or anything. Don't buy live bed stock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So top level things in general, I think we've talked about that, and I think we have some ideas on how to do that. Um, value classes. Boo, value classes. <laughs> Yay, opaque types. So, I mean, for the, just for the record, you know, we're not going to fight this out, but uh, I'm just going to do it. Sorry. Next slide. Um, <laughs> so ideas from Dottie, uh, trade parameters, uh, improved lazy valves and trade valves. There's a lot more that, that is happening in the, in the experimental side of Scala that, that we're closely looking at. I mean, obviously, we know these guys. Uh, so we talk to them, and we steal stuff from them, and they don't mind. Um, Implicits is another thing where a lot of simplification still lies beyond the, the scope, you know, how to type them, um, and more stuff. Like, um, you know, I'm, I'm running out of time, luckily, so I don't have to commit to more things to put in the language. Um, there's plenty of JVM shiny coming. Um, so to end the talk, um, you know, <laughs> um, and hopefully not the language, um, you know, we want to avoid. <laughs> We want to avoid Python 3, right? And so that's like, sorry? Spark. What, what do you mean? <laughs> oh, right, yes, I will. I will. Um, hey, Spark guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, the key thing here that I see for, for the key challenge ahead of us is that we want to keep the language moving. I think I've shown you the direction that we're thinking about, which is you know, making people more productive. Um, finding a good balance with exciting new features, but mostly emphasizing, you know, better tooling and, and, and friendlier, um, you know, more professional or even more professional um, grade uh, tooling around this. Um, and 
just not repeat Python's mistakes. So thank you very much for attending. Thanks to all the contributors, the community, Scala Center, Inspiration Vivaldi. Any questions? <laughs> you have one minute. <laughs>